Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're currently in a sermon series entitled, Coulda, Shoulda, But Didn't. We're in the book of Judges, so if you got your Bible, you can turn right on over to Judges. We're going to be in chapter 7 today, but really we're going to be on the precipice of the battle that is looming ahead, and we're going to see that in just a couple of weeks. We're going to actually get right into the nitty gritty of the battle. Uh, what we've been doing so far, we've been looking at a judge just recently by the name of Gideon. We've seen Israel being severely oppressed at the hands of the Midianites, the Amalekites, and those from the east. We've seen the angel of the Lord, a, a pre-incarnate version of Christ, it's believed, tell Gideon that God will use him to secure victory over the Midianites. We've seen Gideon destroying the altar of Baal and the grove of trees that are next to the altar. Basically drawing a line in the sand that God is, God is supreme and God is using him to draw that line in the sand. And we've seen Gideon ask God to confirm his promise in a test of fleece. Perhaps this test, it was to assure the rest of the men alongside Gideon. We're not entirely sure. But all of this, this is the backdrop to today's text. In verse 7, we're going to go in our main text, verses 1 through 18. Let me just read that for you. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them on the hill of Moreh. In the valley, uh, the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore, come proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. <clears throat> So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore, it, said, it shall be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to, the wa to their mouth, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. The Lord, uh, the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped, and I will give the Midianites into, you, into your hands, so let all the other people go, each man to his home. So the 300 men took the people's provisions and tr their trumpets into their hands. And Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. But if you are afraid to go down, go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp, and you will hear what they say. And afterward, your hands will be strengthened that you may go against the camp. Uh, go against the camp. So he went with Pura, his servant, down to the outposts of the army. That was in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Malachites and the sons of the east were laying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. That when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. 
a loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian. And it came to the tent and it struck it so that it fell. And it turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. His friend replied, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. When Midian heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them, with torches inside the pitchers. He said to them, Look at me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you shall blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, For the Lord and for Gideon. I love how God, he whittles down this army. So they are smaller and smaller and eventually only 300 men. God, he was going to use those 300 men to do something mind-boggling. They would defeat the Midianites, the Amalekites, and those from the east. Today's message is entitled, 300. Let's pray. Dearly Father, come before you today, Lord, in your hands little as much. And so God, I pray today as we talk about this group of 300, Lord, and how you've prepared it and how you whittled it down. And Lord, uh, Lord, we're going to see in a couple of weeks how you use this small group in just <laughs> unexplainable ways. Lord, you do a miracle. Uh, and so, Lord, we thank you for how you can use anything. Lord, there's nothing that is unable to be used in your hands. And so, God, I pray today that you would speak to our hearts and that you would challenge us with your word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to start off, uh, we'll, we'll read Judges 7-1 again. This is what it says. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, Gideon, he was given the nickname Jeroboam, which means let Baal plead his own case. Let Baal avenge himself for what Gideon has done to him. This nickname for Gideon, it's used again to remind the reader how truly weak Baal is, how truly weak foreign god worship is. And this account and what's going to follow is going to further highlight that truth. Now, reading this opening verse, you see two armies converging at one specific point, the spring of Herod. Here's an interesting aside. The word Herod, it actually means trembling. And perhaps it is alluding to those uh, original army members, some of those original people with Gideon, of those maybe 32,000 people that start off with Gideon. So here they are. You have some of this large number that we definitely see later on. They are afraid. So perhaps this whole area is named appropriately in light of that. But this is what you have. On one side of the spring of Herod, you have Gideon and his army of 32,000 people. On the other side of the spring of Herod, you have the Midianites, the Amalekites, and those from the east. An army that was roughly 135,000 soldiers in size. And it goes on, it says in verses 2 and 3, The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. 
So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. God said to Gideon, there are too many people with you right now. So Gideon was to go to them and say, if you're afraid, if you are trembling, then you should leave. And at that point, 22,000 people left. Only 10,000 remained. Now, for you math scholars, that is more than two-thirds of the army. Poof! Gone. This entire account is all about God. God doing the outstanding through the completely outnumbered. Just a little foreshadowing. 10,000 was also way, way, way too many. <laughs> Verses 4 through 6. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore, it shall be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. Gideon's army has been depleted from 32,000 down to 10,000. And now it was going to be depleted even further to only 300 men. The entire army now consisting of unafraid people. They go down to the water. Basically, God tells Gideon to have these people drink. And if the person kneels, and if he gets right down, face into the ground, that person is not going to go into battle. If the person, he bends down, scoops up the water, and he laps it like a dog, that person is obviously the one that you want to take into battle with you. Those are the ones. So, when this is all completed, there are only 300 people that bend over and scoop up water and lap it like a dog. And those people are the only ones eligible to go into battle alongside Gideon. Now, this was a really interesting way to sort out the people. Uh, remember, there are now 10,000 unafraid people who are going to go into battle. And this was their last chance to get water before the throngs of battle. And you want to think about this. It's very interesting in the fact that 9,700 people, they just flail right in and they indulge. They are so interested in getting as much water as they possibly can that they end up not really still being focused, not having the correct motives, I guess, uh, in all of this battle. It really comes down to the 300 people, when they lap down, they still are in a position where they could end up going into battle. But this kneeling, this, it was this throwing themselves in the water that God didn't want. I'm not entirely sure all the reasons, but it was a very interesting way to weed out this army. Judges 7, 7 through 8. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands so let all the other people go, each man to his home. So the 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands. And Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Imagine, after you get a drink of water, officially ready to now go into battle, then you are told, go home. You kneeled. <laughs> you can't go because you kneeled to get a drink of water. Then 9,700 people disperse, leaving only 300 men. 
So before this army of 300 men go into battle, these 300 men grab a trumpet in one hand and other provisions in their other. That means both hands are full with items. Items that were scattered through the 10,000 people. Now they're being carried by 300. It's pretty clear, and it's becoming clearer, that God was going to again do something. That only God was able to get glory from this victory that was looming ahead of them. Verse 8. It closes with Gideon and the 300 looking over the army down below them in the valley. Verses 9 through 11. Now, this, now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. But if you are afraid to go down and go with, uh, go with Pura, your servant, uh, down to the camp, and you will hear what they say, and afterward your hands will be strengthened, that you may go down against the camp. So he went with Pura, his servant, down to the outpost of the army that was in the camp. That very night, God tells Gideon, go and attack now. However, <laughs> if you are fearful... Why don't you go down and see for yourself what the Midianites are saying? And make sure you don't go by yourself. Bring a witness with you, someone to verify what you are about to see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears. So Gideon, he takes Pura, his servant, with him, and the two of them go and spy out the Midianites' camp. Verse 12, now the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east were lying in the valley, as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. This army in the valley was huge. The author of Judges, he uses the picture of locusts. Okay? Locusts, they come in by hordes. And they are in such a vast number. That's how locusts come on in. And that is what this army that had gathered in the valley, that's what it looked like. A horde of locusts. It's believed that this army, again, it consisted of roughly 135,000 men. Huge army. Now, it also mentioned the vast number of camels. And what's really interesting about that is camels weren't really a, a battle animal. What camels were used for was for transporting things. They were for loading and packing. Remember, the main reason that this army had even gotten together, it was to go and plunder the Israelites. It was not a response to Gideon. It was just something that they yearly did. And it just so happens when they got there, probably word spread and they heard of Gideon. So again, these vast number of camels, it spoke to what they were personally anticipating, which was to be an easy pillaging. Verses 13 to 14. Then Gideon came, well, when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and, it, and struck it so that it fell, and it turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. His friend replied, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. Here's what happens. Gideon goes with his servant Pura, and he spies out the other army. And it seems like the first thing that Gideon hears is this conversation. And there's this one person in the conversation who is relaying a dream that he just had. Now here's a little backdrop. Israel, they had been so impacted by these yearly raids 
that Israel was forced to live off of barley bread. Now, barley, uh, this, this crop, it was used for food for the poor and for animals. The Greeks actually would say barley bread was food hardly fit to be eaten. It was beneath them. And so that's what's kind of being said here. Uh, this, again, is the dream. A barley loaf, it comes rolling down a hill into the Midianite camp. And this barley loaf, it hits a tent, and it turns a tent upside down. Now, that's odd for a small barley loaf to come rolling in and to knock over a tent. In Hebrew, that phrase, turn it upside down, it literally means that it fell with the bottom upwards. It was turned topsy-turvy. It meant that the entire tent was demolished and that there was no raising it up again. I want you to listen to the response of the person that heard this dream. This barley loaf must be Gideon. If that's the case, then God has given the Midianites, that's all of us, into the hands of Gideon and the Israelites, those barley loaf eaters. Verse 15. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. Simply hearing this dream drives Gideon back to a place of worship. Gideon thanks God. Hearing this dream, it just further confirms that God is going to do something outstanding through people totally outnumbered. So Gideon, he returns to the Israelite camp, and he gives the battle cry. Yahweh has given the camp of the Midianites into your hands. Verses 16 to 17. He, Gideon, divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them, with torches inside the pitchers. He said to them, Look at me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. Gideon, what he does here is he splits the 300 men into three groups, probably a hundred in each group. And each person in these groups, they are given a trumpet and an empty pitcher and a torch. The empty pitcher, it was going to protect the torches, the torches flame from the elements. And it would also give uh, the, the people a little bit of an element of surprise because that, that pitcher was going to dampen the light. It was like putting your light on mute. It was going to kind of partially conceal the torch. That's the idea. Verse 18. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you also blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, for the Lord and for Gideon. Picture this. It's nighttime. And a group of people emerge in front of you. And at the same time as a group that emerges in front of you, there is a group to your left and there is a group to your right. Normally, not everyone in your army has a trumpet. So hearing 300 trumpets, it would make the opposition think that there are more out there. That's the idea. And the Israelites, rushing down toward the Midianite tents, they were going to be saying, for Yahweh and for Gideon, adding to the opposition's fear that was already apparently welling inside them. In two weeks, we're going to actually see how this battle unfolds. And it's really, again, it's remarkable, but it is God doing the outstanding with the outnumbered. So what? Uh, humanly speaking, Israel, again, was just vastly outnumbered. In Israel, they stood no chance against an army that was of at least 135,000 soldiers. Here's what swung the odds drastically in Israel's favor. 
the one true God, Yahweh, was on their side. Do you realize if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the power that's residing inside of you is just astronomical. The Holy Spirit isn't just active around us. The Holy Spirit is active inside of us. There is nothing in your life, past, present, or future, that God's not powerful enough to fix and restore and be able to still use you. That's remarkable. It really comes down to, will you follow God one step at a time? Barring all other things, just focusing on God, relying on Him, being completely uh, just, just taken, uh, taken aside in the wonder and awe of Him. This passage, it talks about people who are afraid, uh, trembling, and fearful. When you look to your circumstances, it can seem overwhelming sometimes. But again, no matter what we face, we have a God who is more powerful. It comes down to will you trust and obey God every single moment? Truth is, in our small area, 300 is actually a decent-sized crowd. What makes it so small in this context is what it's compared against. That's the same with our troubles and our hardships. It comes down to what will you compare it against. If we compare whatever we're facing against the God we serve, there is nothing too difficult. It comes down to where your focus is. And I'm praying this week that our focus would be firmly fixed on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God give us opportunities to glorify Him. And may we reach out and encourage those around us with the hope of the gospel this week. May God use you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, again, 300 300 people in this area is a vast number. But Lord, in this context, it was a very small number. Lord, I pray as you look at us, Lord, I pray that our hearts would seek you and desire you. Lord, I pray that you would give this small area, Lord, a burden, a passion. Lord, help us to pray for our communities around us, Lord, our governments, Lord, our, our just the nation in a whole. Lord, it desperately needs prayer. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you would use us in our small number to bring you glory and honor. Lord, use us this week, however you see fit. And for it all, Lord, we will just elevate you and sing you praise. We love you and we praise in your precious name. Amen.